sometimes you hear a motherfucker who's so full of shit that you start to wonder if somebody swapped out the labels on their hemorrhoid medicine and their denture adhesive. And sometimes you hear a motherfucker who's so full of shit, you start wondering how hard that would be to pull off. Enter Francis Collins on NPR's Up First last Sunday. That's not a program that I normally listen to, but when I check my Facebook and I see a dozen friends talking about wanting to punch their radios, I smell diatribe, so I checked it out. And I was reminded why I reserve a chunk of the show for telling people how hard they can go fuck themselves. Now, if the name doesn't ring a bell, Francis Collins is the former director of the National Institutes of Health and even more former director of the Human Genome Project. And he's also one of the like three scientists willing to sacrifice their reputation by babbling about silly God shit. And he's the one who sounds the least stupid when he does it. So evangelicals never miss an opportunity to trot him out as proof that some of their best friends are scientists, as was the case on Sunday when he spent 26 minutes on an entirely credulous fluff piece about how Jesus Christ is the one true son of God and the only path to salvation. So he starts off with this disingenuous origin story about how he was an avowed atheist. Those are the interviewer's words, not his, but he didn't disagree with him. But then he got to the part of medical school where you you had to get to know terminal patients. And just when you thought he was going to be honest and talk about how it was fear of death that scared him off of pure reason, he jumps into the I was convinced by all the swell arguments in favor of God's song and dance. He then delineates all those stellar arguments that convinced him. And it's basically like, Christian apologetics greatest hits in bullet point form. He never went full wire. They're still monkeys, but he trotted out the fine tuning argument. The it takes more faith to be an atheist. Canard. Hell, at one point he tried to do the whole like, then where do morals come from? But he has to admit that he can explain moral behaviors through evolutionary biology. Right. Because like if we were all immoral, we wouldn't have survived as a species. But, But then he has to retreat to saying, but you can't explain the existence of like, you know, morality as a concept, which is like saying that we can explain why humans need vegetables and grains, but not why they need food. It's just, it's embarrassingly devoid of logic, not to mention insulting is all hell, right? I got kind of hard to imagine NPR devoting a half hour interview to a converted Muslim explaining all the reasons that they decided Christianity had it wrong. And, And as if that wasn't bad enough, the interviewer earns a spot in the nearest wood chipper by suggesting that anti vaxxers would probably be more amenable to, you know, getting their vaccines if the same scientists that were telling them that those were safe weren't also telling them there was no God. And, and, and she, I should say, she presents this not as you know bigotry that those Christians need to overcome, but rather as a strategy that those scientists should rethink. And rather than saying something reasonable like, whoa, it sounds an awful lot to me, like you're suggesting that the victims of bigotry should be more accommodating to the bigots, Francis Collins nods along and gives her xenophobic screed a patina of scientific respectability by backing it up with some half-assed study or another. But more than the sheer stupidity of the arguments he's bringing up and and more than the inherent prejudice that went into greenlighting the segment in the first place, I was bothered by the pomposity with which it was framed. Because, look, when your actual question is, does the wizard who created the universe love me too much for me to ever die? And your, and your goal is to make it sound reasonable. You have to rely on euphemism a lot. In fact, we're genuinely nine minutes into this piece before they just come out and say the words, the existence of God. Up until then, they're hiding it behind the most grandiose possible phrasing. The interviewer keeps saying that they're asking the big questions, the biggest questions, and at one point even, the biggest questions in the universe. No, the fuck you're not. Your questions are tiny and stupid. You're asking the smallest, dumbest, most feeble-minded possible questions. You're literally asking questions so grossly uninformed that humans were asking the exact same ones in the exact same ways before we knew what wheels were. Big questions are ones that lead us to new and better questions. Big questions are all about real problems with real potential solutions. Questions that you ask with the hopes of answering them rather than for the sake of asking them. Questions like, is there a God or is there an afterlife are exactly the same size as questions like, is there a Doctor Strange and is there a mirror dimension? Well, actually, no, they're not. They don't even get that fucking big. You have to abandon the size metaphor altogether at a certain point because there's no such thing as negative size. 
But, you know, like if a genuine question leads to an answer, then the nonsense that they were asking Francis Collins must have been anti-questions. Relitigating the God question over and over inhibits answers. I mean, you know, I'll admit there was certainly a time when it was a meaningful question, but then it got a meaningful answer. And that answer was no. We can argue about when that proposition was ultimately settled, but we definitely polished it off before either myself or Francis fucking Collins was even born. And to the extent that we've accepted the answer, we've been able to generate newer, more informed and more useful and, dare I say, bigger questions that we could ever have articulated when we we're still worried about offending an invisible fucking space wizard. So, look, if you want to sit down in the middle of the knowledge aisle and stubbornly refuse to move forward, I guess there's nothing we can really do about that. You know, the rest of us don't really feel like dragging you deeper into understanding any more than you feel like being dragged. But don't try to pretend like it's some kind of principled sit in. It's a goddamn intellectual temper tantrum and there aren't many things smaller than that.